Dr. Mohamed Dessoui, uh, and he's going to present special types of breast carcinoma. Dr. Dessoui. Very good. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you again for the Dr. Al Mahdi and for the organizing committee, for the panel, and for all of you. So I'm going to talk. I talked in the first talk about the invasive lobular carcinoma, which is a special type of breast cancer. And now I'm going to continue the list of the special type. When I say special type, because most of the carcinomas in the breast, we call it NST, no special type, most of them. But the special types are the rare uh, entity. When I say rare, it is not like 1% or 10% or so. It is comparable to the no special type. It is considered less in frequency, if you will. So this is at the lab. Here we have five breast pathologists, most of them here. Uh, as I said, I am, doing, uh, I am directing the fellowship for the breast and GYN combined. In addition, I just created an international fellowship for the uh, international trainees. Uh, and we have the first candidate from Ain Shams University this year, just started a month ago. So if you are interested, just please uh, contact me and my email address and uh, phone number with Dr. Al Mahdi if you don't catch me. So the topics here, most of the titles here, if the time will not help, we can stop any time on any of those titles. I'm talking about those list, tubular carcinomas, cribriform, mucinous, then the mucinous, the new entity, mucinous cystadinocarcinoma, the invasive micropapillary carcinoma, and the carcinoma with epocrine differentiation, carcinoma with medullary features, and metablastic carcinoma. I think we talked a lot today about the metablastic carcinoma. I may just omit the metablastic carcinoma from the talk if we don't have time. Okay, everyone is ready? How many trainees here? Please raise your hand. Trainees, resident, Mudaris Musaid. Okay, very good. So I may beck on you guys. I may ask you questions and I will just, uh, just raise your hand. Okay, <laughs> I will ask you easy questions. Are you ready? So buckle up. Okay, so the special type carcinomas, we said most of the carcinomas, no special types. But what is the special type? You look at the special type component of the list I just mentioned. And you see how much percent. If it is greater than 90%, so this is the special type, tubular or mucinous or whatever, as we will discuss. If it is less than 50%, so it is not. It is NST, no special type. Then you go to the category from 50 to 90% in the middle. It is not 90 or more. So you call here, maybe you, call, you can call any type, mix it type. You call with, for example, tubular features, mucinous features, and so on. The whole point, how you, how, how you evaluate this, how you call it 90%, if about 89%, what I'm going to do? So this is, you know, the challenge we face. And this is, as I said, this is the job security. Then we can just go and, you know, do your opinion and see how much, show to colleagues around, and at the end you have to end up with something. Because it has a management consequences. Are we going to do sentinel lymph nodes or no? Are we going to do what or no? Okay? So... Let us talk about the tubular carcinoma, the most easy one here. And the definition, I will start with the definition, the morphologic features. I'm not going to discuss the clinical features because of the time constraints here. But this is a well-differentiated carcinoma, grade one. Is every grade one tubular carcinoma? Definitely not. But have well-formed tubules with open lumina. This is in the definition. And most of the cases ER positive, PR positive, if you will, and the HER2 negative, okay? But let us go in more details a little bit on this. So it is well-formed glands, well-formed tubules with infiltrative growth better. Single layer of epithelial cells, no brainer here, any carcinoma. Single layer of epithelial cells enclosing an open lumen. You have open lumen, not solid, uh, solid groups of cells. But when you look at this, uh, the cells are small to intermediate, as we said, grade one nuclei, and with some apical snouts. Prominent desmoblastic reaction. What is the definition of the, uh, yeah, so the tubules itself, I forgot to add it here, maybe in the next slide. May be associated with flat epithelial etibia, low grade ductal carcinoma in situ, and lobular neoplasia, I discussed in the first lecture. So those are the Rosen's triad. Rosen triad, you may have this in the board question if you go to the, to the uh, uh, pathology board, okay? But the glands 
What, what is this? Okay. So, if you have a stratification, if you have significant nuclear bleomorphism, high mitotic index are contraindications for the diagnosis of tubular carcinoma. But the tubules has certain features. The tubules here, to call it tubular carcinoma, has certain features. It looks like teardrop-like. One side like blunted end, and the other is pointed. You know, like the teardrops, as we'll see the teardrop here. You see the teardrop here? One side blunted, and the other side is pointed out. Okay? And no, every gland has, component, has lumen in it. One layer only of cells, and all of them low grade. Okay? If you have all of this in 90, greater than 90% in the core biopsy, call it tubular carcinoma. Most probably the people will just be afraid to say that because what is the consequence of say, if you say pure tubular carcinoma in the core? Most of the, of the places will not do sentinel lymph nodes because the chance of going to the lymph nodes is minimal in this. Most of the people call with tubular features on the core biopsy and they say, okay, I will characterize it further in the excision. That's okay if you uh, are not confident enough. But everything is teardrops, everything one layer, Everything has lumen, everything low grade, so it is pure tubular carcinoma in the core biopsy. More close-up view here to show you the teardrops and the open lumina. And this is again more pictures of the same here. There's some, maybe you go to the other side here, you have some single filing of cells. So this is what? Tubulolobular carcinoma. Again, tubulolobular carcinoma, I said in the first lecture, if you do ECA adherin, what is the ECA adherin here? The trinese will be positive in which component? Both component. Very good. Is this 100%? Definitely not. Definitely not. You may find some ECA adherin negative in the lobular component. The differential diagnosis is very important for you here. The most important differential diagnosis to, di to differentiate this from radial scar. You look at the radial scar in the core biopsy and look at the center. Center empty and periphery, there is proliferation, most probably radial scar. Center, there is something, some glands with teardrops, and when you go to the periphery, start to fade or low proliferation, most probably tubular carcinoma. So this is the most important differential. The immunohistochemistry for the myoepithelial markers are your friends in here. Do multiple. We do P63. Calponin and SMM, any other, you have tons of myoepithelial markers. You can use whatever you like. Don't do one only. It may be negative, you're stuck, or positive, you're stuck. So do panel here. And most probably, sclerosing uh, radial scar, the glands in the radial scar are positive for the myoepithelial markers. We are lucky for that. Very, very rare to find glands not tubular, not carcinoma, and uh, still uh, losing the myoepithelial markers. So this is the first differential diagnosis. Central fibrosis, no proliferation. You go to the periphery, there is the usual ductal hyperplasia and so on. And the tubular is the reverse. The second is the microglandular adenosis. Again, those glands, single layer of cells going infiltrative pattern. But when you look at the lumen of those, you may find some secretion-like material or secretion material in the lumen. You do the myoepithelial markers, then you what? You're stuck here. It's lost. It is lost. Negative for this. You know, I remember one of my colleagues gave me microglandular adenosis and they come rush in among the group and they said, well, how you grade this tumor? Then I looked at the slides. Then I don't want to embarrass him because it may be not even carcinoma. But I don't want at the same time to tell him grade one. I told him it could be microglandular adenosis. Very good, excellent. What is this? I told him the question is not like that. He asked me, what is this? Not how you grade this. Anyhow, so microglandular adenosis lack, uh, adenosis lack the myoepithelial cell layer. The tubules have rounded, not the, not the teardrops. Rounded, okay? And very, very low grade. No atibia there, okay? Xenophilic, colloid-like secretions. And when you do immunohistochemistry, do the S100. Okay, the collagen, collagen type 4, okay? I don't know if you do collagen type 4 or, or, or no, but the, the S100 is a very good marker for this. Then the other differential diagnosis, the NSCT carcinoma, the low-grade one, the low-grade NST, will differentiate it invasive ductal carcinoma. Usually the ducts are rounded, not teardrops, or some teardrops, some rounded, one layer also, but it is low-grade by the Nottingham. 
and the tubulolobular carcinoma as I showed you. Let us see some pictures here. What is this? You see go the elastosis in the center. Try to see the center. Which center is center? I don't know. But you look at the center here. There is no glands, you know. Go to the periphery of any elastosis. This is proliferation, so radial scar. You do the myoepithelial markers, lucky enough. Every single cell positive for the B63 and other markers. Okay, microglandular adenosis. You see infiltrated pattern, but you see the, the glands are rounded, not teardrops. Some secretions, maybe this caption has no secretion, but this is microglandular adenosis. More close-up view, rounded glands, one layer of cell. Tubulolobular carcinoma, as we mentioned. Okay, and this is the ECAD here in, in this particular case. As I said, I send this case all the time to the board so for the ECAD hearing. Okay, so you catch one question here if you are going to sit for the board. Any question? No, not at the end, no question. Okay, so we move forward to the cribriform carcinoma. Cribriform invasive, we're talking about the invasive special type carcinomas. So the cribriform is well differentiated carcinoma also, prominent desmoblastic stroma reaction usually ER positive, PR positive, and HER2 negative. The morphology resembles the cribriform ductal carcinoma in situ, but the borders, look at the borders of those cribriforming. It is irregular, angulated contours with infiltrative growth pattern. We'll see the pictures. Concurrent low-grade ductal carcinoma in situ and the mucinous carcinomas are very common. Even the WHO, the previous one, even put them together, cribriform carcinoma mucinous slash, something like that, if I remember it correctly. I don't think the new version 2019 has this, a separate cribriform carcinoma. The tumor cells are small to intermediate in size, lack significant etibia, and they have low mitotic uh, index. Usually, cribriform is low grade. This picture here, I uh, presented this to the right here. This is the invasive cribriform carcinoma. And to the left of the screen, you have the uh, cribriform ductal carcinoma inside. Look at the contour. The contour is irregular. And there is bouching and outbouching of this. But the ductal carcinoma inside to rounded contour. This is uh, just everything here is invasive cribriform carcinoma. Again. There is cribriform formation and contours are not rounded. As, as I said, the, the, the most important differential here is the cribriform ductal carcinoma in situ and the, the borders, as I said, myoepithelial markers is, are very helpful, but don't forget, there is maybe 5% or even more of the ductal carcinoma in situ could lose the myoepithelial markers. And on the other side, there is invasive carcinomas with retained myoepithelial markers. The most common parent one of them is metablastic carcinomas. You go to do P63, it is positive. Don't say, hey, it is not. No, it could be still invasive carcinoma. So the adenoid cystic carcinoma, we are not going to discuss this, but it is, has luminal and myoepithelial cells, intraluminal basement membrane-like material, like the adenoid cystic carcinoma and the salivary glands. And the most important is ER negative, PR negative in most of the cases. Those low-grade tumors, the, the are high grade, are ERBR positive, are ERBR positive. But if it is negative, you start to think, is this could be metastatic carcinoma, could be adenoid cystic carcinoma, could be something else. We don't have cribriform carcinoma, triple negative, may be very rare. If you have few cases, you will have definitely a publication of this. Well differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma also is in the differential diagnosis of this. In this case here, I have this case, we bet on this case. Me and my colleagues, some of us say ductal carcinoma in situ, say, some others say no, this is a cribriform invasive carcinoma. We'll take here the vote from the audience here who think this is an invasive. Raise your hand. Two, three, who think this is ductal carcinoma in situ? No one. So, so it is difficult. Sometimes it is difficult. Then you bet and your chance is what? 50-50 chance. Then you do the myoepithelial markers, everything is intact here. So ductal carcinoma in situ. Uh, and this is the differential diagnosis. I have this uh, publication coming for adenoid cystic carcinoma characterization in the breast lesion in, uh, at our institution. So this is adenoid cystic carcinoma. And this particular case has ER positivity. Anyhow, then we move forward to mucinous carcinoma. Clusters of epithelial cells floating or suspended in pools of extracellular mucin. Almost always ER positive, PR positive, HER2 negative. And when you see mucinous carcinoma in the breast, ER negative, PR negative, this is 
metastatic carcinoma, metastatic colon carcinoma without thinking or mucinous from anywhere, I mean most probably colon. So those are help also in the diagnosis. The morphology, the pure mucinous carcinoma, as I said, requires any one of them greater than 90%, and the mixed uh, carcinoma from uh, here from 10 to 90. If you have some mucin, just to call with mucinous features, even if it is 10%. But if you go with the rigid rules, 50 to 90, mix it, and everything is NST, that's okay also. But when you see mucin, you just say with mucinous features. Maybe have some prognostic factors or so. Nuclear grade low to intermediate, and the tumors with high nuclear grade breast classified as invasive breast cancer NST with mucin production. So you call it like that, okay? Or, or mix it or so. Don't call high grade of those mucinous carcinomas, high grade mucinous carcinomas, don't call it pure, even if it is greater than 90%. Because those usually, some of good fraction of those PR negative or PR weak PR, and the prognosis will be comparable to the NST carcinomas. Pure mucinous carcinomas may have foci with micropapillary pattern, and this has many publications of this. So this is the classic picture here. You have extra... Uh, uh, cellular pools of mucin and those cells are floating in this, okay, the low-grade uh, uh, nuclei. And this is more than, and you see here some DCIS here also to the left of the screen and all those floating mucin, low-grade uh, cells in the, in the mucin, uh, yes. Then the signet ring cell differentiation, as I said in the first lecture, they dropped it from the WHO. But carcinoma with signet ring cell differentiation, this is the uh, carcinoma with signet ring cells without extracellular mucins are not classified as mucinous carcinomas. Either to call it, can, you can insist that the WHO is not the only source for the pathology, as all of you know. This is just a, a, a good source for us. But you have many others. If you still consider signet ring carcinoma, just go ahead. Signet ring cytomorphology in most cases of uh, invasive lobular carcinomas here, okay? But sometimes when I have this, I do the ECAD hearing. If ECAD hearing is negative, uh, is positive, I don't call it uh, lobular. Because this is not classic, has signet ring. It is positive, I call it invasive duct carcinoma with signet ring features. Carcinoma with signet ring cell differentiation must be distinguished from metastatic breast cancer. More commonly to have metastatic signet ring than pure mu uh, signet ring carcinoma of the breast. Do I have two minutes? Twelve? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, so the differential diagnosis, the most important here for you guys is the mucosil-like lesion. You just sometimes you see no cells, just mucin, or few scattered cells, benign cells. So this is the differential diagnosis. And at our institution, we consider this high risk. If, you, if the mucosil-like lesion, we usually we excise. And this is you sit with the clinician, say what you want to do in this, and you have to have your own policy. Doesn't have to have, we don't have like universal policies for this, even for the, the excisions for flat epithelial etibia and others. So absence of cytologic etibia, presence of myoepithelial cells adherent to those groups of cells, if any, floating in the mucin. You call it muc mucosil-like lesion. Metastatic mucinous carcinomas to the breast, as has been said, those are usually ER negative, PR negative, and no DCIS, unless you're stuck with mucinous carcinoma coming from ovary or something like that, and you do the ER, maybe positive. Mu mucosil like lesion, you see mostly mucin only, mostly mucin, there is no much cells, calcifications, and so on. So call it, you call this mucosil like lesion, and they put differential diagnosis, and as I said, at our institution, they will excise this. Then the new entity and the WHO, when I'm looking at the WHO, when I'm preparing this talk, then I found this mucinous cystadenocarcinoma. Okay, so what is this? It is a cystic structures lined by tall columnar cells with abundant intracytoplasmic mucin, resembling the pancreatico biliary or ovarian mucinous carcinoma. We see the pictures, we'll see the pictures. Usually ER negative, PR negative, HER2 negative, triple negative tumors. So this is the morphology, well circumscribed solid and cystic masses. The cystic spaces usually contain gelatinous material. There is no much extracellular mucin. The mucin most probably is intracellular. Stratification, tufting, and the papillary formations looks like the pancreatic copillary, the GI. Basally located nuclei, abundant intracytoplasmic, abundant intracytoplasmic mucin. Mucin is also present 
within the cystic species, but not that much like the pure mucinous carcinomas. The degree of cytologic atypia is variable, and when you do the markers, the CK7 is positive, 20 negative, CDX2 is negative. So most probably not coming from the pancreatic biliary uh, tract. This is the picture of the case here. Looks like if I have this case, you will call this what? Like papillary and all this intracellular mucin. There is little mucin in the lumen of this. You may call this metastatic carcinoma. It is not a primary breast cancer, but this is the primary uh, mucinous cystadenocarcinoma. More of the same here to show you the micro papillary and papillary features and some regular glands here. Another caption for this looks like GI tumor or ovarian tumor. And this is a very busy table. I'm not going to go through this, but this is the one of the big uh, study for this. It has 27 cases of those mucinous cystadenocarcinomas. If you look at those, the CK7 positive in all of those cases or mostly all of them, CK20 negative in almost all of the cases except one case, and so on. ERBR mostly, as you see in this table, and HER2 negative. So this is triple negative, but there is nothing else somewhere else. You have to exclude metastatic carcinoma first. Differential diagnosis to differentiate from the pure mucinous carcinomas, the encapsulated papillary carcinoma, both are typically and strongly and diffusely positive for ER and PR. As I said, those are predictive markers, but you could use this too in the differential diagnosis. Encapsulated papillary carcinomas lacks the intracytoplasmic mucin, and the presence uh, and the absence of DCIS metastatic carcinoma should be also raised in this uh, entity. The invasive micropapillary carcinoma, I am a little bit fast to catch the time for you here, composed of small, hollow, or morula like clusters with cleft around the cells, around the groups of cells, of malignant cells, surrounded by clear spaces, and inside, outside, in, inside out growth better. The morphology cuboidal to columnar cells without fibrovascular cores. So groups of micropapillary, no fibrovascular cores, and the, located in the empty spaces. And the reverse polarity, the apical pool of the tumor cells, Membrane faces the clear spaces, like reversed, okay? And we'll see the stains for this. Is xenophilic and the dense or fi finally granular cytoplasm, and those tumors are ER, PR positive, and HER2 uh, negative or variable. Weak to mo moderate staining, I uh, will see this. Yeah, this is important for the, when you interpret the HER2, as we'll see. The U-shaped basolateral expression of the HER2 one side of the cell is missing. So what we are going to call, if you go to the definition and the interpretation of the HER2, but in this particular type, it is not complete, not weak or moderate complete. There is one side missing, but still we call it equivocal, and we send it for fish for, uh, or any in situ hybridization. The, the, in this publication, they use the epithelial membrane antigen is expressed on the luminal aspect in the well-differentiated invasive breast cancer or NST, but it lines the stroma facing. So the reverse here, reverse polarity. If you use the EMA, you will find, I will show you the picture of this. So this is here the micropapillary here, DCIS to the right. So this is not metastatic carcinoma, most probably. And the microinvasive carcinoma to the left. Those groups of malignant cells located in these empty spaces with clefts around them. More of the same, micro-invasive micropapillary carcinoma. More close-up view, more of the same. I th yes, this is the EMA. Look at the staining pattern here, facing the clear spaces, facing the clear spaces. I am not showing you the picture to use the MA to diagnose, but just to show you because this is published here and you have this. This is the HER2, you see, it is U-shaped. The apical aspect is just negative. We call this, um, uh, equivocal, two plus, and we do fish for this. You see, one side of the cell is negative, but so it's still equivocal. Then we, at our institution, we do in uh, dual in situ hybridization and we examine by light microscope. Then you count, you go there to count the black dots, which are the HER2, and the red dots, uh, dots which are the CEP17. Then you get, uh, you do the HER2, uh, you see the amplification. Carcinomas with uh, apocrine differentiation. I have a lot of questions in the first lecture about the apocrine differentiation. Large cells with abundant cytoplasm, xenophilic or granular cytoplasm. Nuclei in this are enlarged, marked etibia, 
prominent nucleoli. Mitotic activity is usually moderate to high. Because the apocrine cells by nature, they have some etibia, but still benign. So to call it carcinoma, you need more of the etibia, more than usual. You need more prominent nucleoli, you need more, more etibia, and so on to call in this group. Usually those tumors are uh, ER negative, PR negative, but the androgen receptor positive here. And the HER2 overexpression in a good fraction of those. So you have a good fraction, maybe like 50% of the, or so of those tumors are HER2 positive, ER negative, PR negative. So this is here one of the invasive apocrine carcinomas. I think you see the plenty of xenophilic cytoplasm, the, the high grade etibia. So this most of those tumors will be grade three. You will find a lot of mitosis in those. We'll take three, score three for the gland, score three for the etibia. Then you go to the mitosis to count the mitosis and the good luck in that. Then to put it either in two or three, category Nottingham three. Maybe another case here, this is like uh, the, to show you the cytoplasm, the prominent nucleoli and the atibia. This may be the same case I presented in the cystadenal carcinoma. Uh, the differential diagnosis here, the apocrine atibia, apocrine DCIS involving a sclerosing lesion and the granular cell tumor, one of the differential diagnosis, benign lesion here with granular xenophilic cytoplasm. But the granular cell tumor are uh, negative, but lack the nuclear ETB. And don't express the keratin, and usually S100 positive and CD68 uh, positive. Oncocytic carcinomas are very rare type and may show positivity for the GCDF B15 and the HER2 and are usually ER negative. There's a lot of carcinomas here for you. I don't know how much you remember for the three knees here of this. Either to remember this in the board exam or say, ah, oh, what did he say before? So this is like in situ apocrine uh, DCIS. This is big table for the differential diagnosis of the mimickers and the differential diagnosis of apocrine carcinomas. I'm not going to go through this for the time sake and the lecture will be in the PDF file. And for the next few minutes, the carcinoma with medullary features, this is taken out from the, the, the WHO. No one acknowledged this anymore, but it was in the presentation. And because you may say, because somebody asked me about this, so don't call this anymore. This is the historically, you know, remember the medullary carcinoma is a tumor with the following features. Sensitial architecture in greater than 75%, lack of glandular or tubular formation, diffused lymphoblasmacytic infiltration, nuclear grade uh, uh, three, and the complete histologic circumscription. And the, the, the consistency among us was terrible here, and the prognosis is not that good as has been known before, so we dropped this medullary carcinomas. Then the next version, we dropped the medullary features, so there is nothing. If you still call it, go ahead, no problem. Tumors with some features that has been classified as invasive carcinoma with medullary features, then your plastic cells are arranged in these solid sheets with geographic necrosis and most probably no DCIS. But most of the cases I see have DCIS. So I don't do, so I just presented this for you not to diagnose it, not just to know that it is omitted from the classification. Something like that, the most important here, sometimes we miss the carcinoma. It is just looks like lymph node or lymphoma or something like that. But if you look carefully in this, you may say, where is the carcinoma cells here? Here they are, here those solid groups or syncytial pattern of growth among, among the lymphoblasmacytic infiltration. You do the keratin markers, then you will find some keratin positivity. And those are triple negative tumors. And in my training, in the fellowship training, we have to do those four markers for every single case. So we do the CK5, we do the CK14, CK17, EGFR. We have to have one of those positive. Because if everything is negative, ER negative, BR negative, HER2 negative, so what is this? It may be not even carcinoma at all. Then I, my, my uh, you know, director of the fellowship says, so you have to have something positive for this. Otherwise, you consider something else. Immunohistochemistry, as I said, triple negative. The tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, usually CD8 positive cytotoxic T cells. The differential diagnosis here, the lymphomas, you do immunostains for the uh, uh, lymphoma markers, and anaplastic large cell lymphoma usually has increased, uh, uh, have been increasingly aborted in patients with what? Silicon implants. So this is uh, this bunch of publications about this to, uh, to exclude anaplastic large cell lymphomas in the implants uh, excisions. 
And you should differentiate also from intramammary lymph node, which is there is no carcinoma there, there is no epithelial cells. I think I will stop here. We have the next is the metablastic carcinoma, but we discussed the metablastic carcinoma a lot. To we have five minutes. Okay, we can give me five minutes. Thanks so much for this. So let us present this case. I just want to quit, but okay, no way. Uh, okay, 43 years old, female with palpable breast mass on core biopsy, and this is the core biopsy here. There is like, to the lower of the screen, there is groups of malignant cells. The upper side of the screen, this is like cartilaginous hue, and cells among this. Again, here, this is the cartilaginous background, and groups of malignant cells to the lower of the screen, more of the same. Lacuny and uh, atypical cells with bleomorphism and malignant features. So what is your diagnosis here, guys? I think I said this. Is it chondrosarcoma, malignant phyllodes, tumor, metablastic carcinoma, invasive memory carcinoma, NOS, chordoma, or I can add, I don't know, something like that. So this is a metablastic carcinoma. Definitely we need the uh, keratin markers for this. So the metablastic carcinomas are heterogeneous group of neoplasms with epithelial and or mesenchymal elements. And this is the, the list in the WHO here. Low-grade adenocarcinoma, fibromatosis-like, squamous cell carcinoma, spindle cell uh, carcinoma, uh, carcinoma with mesenchymal, mesenchymal differentiation, chondroid, osseous, and other types, and mixed carcinoma. I have a question in the first session today. If you have metablastic and regular NC, NST, what we call, could you could call it mixed carcinoma, mixed metablastic and NST. So I'm not going to go through all of those, uh, but the low-grade adenosquamous is, is, has a special because it is, the, it is all those metablastic carcinomas, or most of them, when I say all, are triple negative tumors. But the prognosis of this tumor particularly is very good. It is called even low-grade, low-grade adenosquamous carcinoma, low-grade tubules, solid squamous components, spindle cell background like fibromatosis-like, and the clusters of lymphocytes usually at the periphery of the lesion. Like this here, you see the, 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 those groups of squam and maybe some tubules. Let us see the next picture. Yeah, here it is. You see, the, the, this is a very characteristic background. And those groups of squamous cells interspersed with this irregular outlines of this uh, low-grade adenosquamous carcinomas. You do the markers for sure. I think the previous pictures here, I did here the P63 is positive in this. And... I don't know, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm going to talk about the squamous cell carcinoma, the pure squamous cell carcinoma of the breast metablastic. You have to exclude first the carcinoma coming from the skin. You have to exclude this, and you see the continuation or the ex extension of the tumor from the skin to the breast. Because primary squamous cell carcinoma is completely different from this category. The prognosis is different. So this is uh, the pure squamous cell carcinoma. The second is very rare, fibromatosis-like carcinoma. Very bland spindle cell arranged in wavy fascicles, stroma with uh, collagenization or collagen. Epithelioid and inflammatory cells are common, especially at the periphery, but you have to do the stains here because you could miss this. We have a lot of those cases could be missed. Then you go to do the markers, the P63, high molecular weight cytokeratin, and the R positive. So you may be dealing here with, uh, you're dealing he here with fibromatosis like. Something like that. It's a little, but there is some, some sort of, of, of etibia. It is not like blend. It is not like, uh, but there is a mild to moderate uh, uh, grade etibia, nuclear etibia. Then the spindle cell carcinoma, the one I said, but higher grade. It is a typical spindle cells arranged in hearing bone like sarcoma or cartwheel and moderate to high grade nuclear etibia like fibromatosis, but started the grade to be a little bit high. Clusters of lymphocytes at the periphery, and the end spectrum could be the end spectrum of squamous cell carcinoma and myoepithelial carcinomas. At certain point, they added the myoepithelial carcinomas to this group, but every time they take it out and in for, I don't know for what. This is here, uh, uh, spindle cell carcinoma. So don't call it spindle carcinoma for low-grade lesions. And what helpful here is the presence of ductal carcinoma in situ next door. Metablastic carcinoma with heterologous mesenchymal differentiation. This is the famous one, as the one I guess I presented. Mesenchymal components, chondroid, osseous, rhabdomyoid, and even neuroglial tissue with carcinomatous areas. Mesenchymal components can range from minimally atypic to very malignant features. 
Something like that, chondroid or mesenchymal differentiation in the chondroid lineage, something like that. And this case also here, also, don't know what is this. So you do stains to differentiate this. And the differential diagnosis, I think, has been discussed in this meeting uh, a lot. So they do the keratins, do a lot of keratin here, broad spectrum in spindle or epithelial cells, EGFR, 76%, variable positive for CK5, CK14, and squamous cell components definitely for P63, and non-squamous tumors express SMA and P63. And you see here, I didn't even include the GATA3 and the, and the, the, the GCDF B15 and the MAMA globin. Mostly those are uh, uh, negative. The GATA3 is, uh, uh, is positive in a good fraction of this tumor also, as has been presented in the previous lecture. And most, most important here is the treble negativity of this tumor. Thank you very much. for your Thank you, Dr. Tsui, for a very in intelligent and uh, wide uh, demonstrative lecture. Um, we move to Dr. Uh